We're so glad you've joined us again for our series in Psalm 23. We're taking very slow steps, one verse a week. And this week we are on the wonderful story of He Restores My Soul. And that picture that actually Pastor Jason talked about a little bit last week about God takes us to places where there is quiet, still waters for rhythms of rest. But I want to talk about a little deeper level about how God fixes the broken places inside of us. So let's uh, tell you a story about sheep. So I was at Life Group a couple years ago, and we were driving out, and it was, you know, probably late spring, so there was light pretty late, and we were done with our life group, and as we were driving out, I noticed that the neighbor who runs a few sheep on his place, that there was a sheep that was exactly as described in this book, uh, A Shepherd Looks at the 23rd Psalm, and he calls it a cast sheep, and what happens is when there's a little dip in the ground, a sheep can somehow lie down and then roll over, and this sheep was lying there just up the driveway a little bit, and it was just like this. It, it honestly wasn't even struggling. It was just like, Bleh! and it just had all of its limbs in the air. So it looked like this. And I didn't realize how big a deal that was, but I knew actually from reading this book that sheep, it's not just that they're stupid, it's that, that they are kind of helpless or Maybe in a more positive way, we can say they just need help sometimes, that there are little things like that can throw them. And uh, and so I went out there and just rolled it over and rolled it downhill, and it got back up on its feet, and it was a little woozy for a bit, and then it ran off. And I thought, what a picture of us, that we need the shepherd all times, but sometimes we get stuck, sometimes we need help. And God has to come along and get us out of our stuckness. And so this is the verse that we're looking at. It says, he restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. I love that picture of he renews or he restores my soul. And it's actually, it's actually a picture of bringing to life again or, or bringing back into the way it's supposed to be. And I don't know about you, but This is a great verse, but I find that there are two groups of people that I need to talk to today. So there are some people who read, he restores my soul, and they're thinking, I don't know that I really need that, because here's their motto. It's fine. I'm fine. Everything is fine. And sometimes it's because we grew up in a Christian home and we didn't have major trauma, like our parents didn't divorce, and we didn't have alcohol and drugs in our home. And and so the story is, I can't compare to people who had more traumatic backgrounds, but I, I'm just going to tell you, I'm fine. And sometimes it's even a little more sinister. It's, I love looking fine. I like people thinking I'm okay. I want to hide my stuff. In fact, Heather said, I've worked with lots of different families, and I've worked with people who've come up in abusive and difficult homes, and they know they're broken. But the people who say, I'm fine, I'm fine, sometimes they're like, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, and I'm drinking my cup of coffee, but the house is burning down. There's really a lot of stuff going on underneath. Because listen carefully, every family is broken. I, I remember that when my brother was taking his counseling training, and he went on to become, a, my brother Rex became a, a full-time counselor, and now he's actually working at a Christian counseling uh, foundation. But he began asking questions about our home. And he began saying, you know, we didn't come from a perfect home. And some of the things that dad did in, in discipline were not good. And, and I remember that Im- immediate instinctual response in me, like, no, we were fine. I come from a good home. I I had good parents. And yet some of the things he said as he brought them out, it's like, yeah, that's, that's not okay. And I think it's important for those people who want to, when you say, how are you doing? And they say, fine. And you say, no, really, how are you doing? And they say, fine. Sometimes we're hiding. Sometimes we want to appear together because we don't want to be the project. We don't want to deal with the hard work of saying, Man, I am not fine. 
Everything is not okay here. So there's some of you, when I read the verse, he restores my soul, you don't think you need restoring, but you do. And there's some of you that are on the other side of the tracks, you're saying like this, some things are, can be fixed and some things are just too broken. And you say, Paul, I'm going to tell you, I had so many things wrong in my home of origin and I've done so many things wrong myself that I can't believe that all this stuff you're saying works for me. And there's this, this disconnect, like Jesus loves everyone. Jesus saves people. Jesus can change lives. And there's this voice in my head that says, but not for me. I'll never get over this addiction. I'll never get out of this habit. I'll, I'll never be married to somebody who really loves me. I, I will never be able to raise my children. And there's this deep belief, a heart core lie that says, God doesn't work for me. And you need to hear this verse even more. He restores my soul and he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And for the first group, the, the people that are more like me that say, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. I want to just do a little probing around in your soul because the first point on your outline there is restoration is needed. Everyone needs it and we need it for our whole life. It's not something you go through a class and you get all done with and it's like, okay, now I'm fine. No, it's that God continues to work in us and sometimes he's healing deep broken places and sometimes he's opening our eyes and sometimes he is pulling things together that, that we didn't understand even about ourselves or about the world. And so I want to probe a little bit around in your soul and, and I want to ask you to consider if there's some places in your life where you are stuck, if there's some things that maybe are indication that you need to be restored and if you would be willing to look at that and admit, okay, yeah, that's true. I can see that I need God to restore me in that way. So let me look at some spots. First one is hot spots. Hot spots are very simple. It's where I react in a situation more than the situation requires. Now, that may be a subjective statement. How do I know what the situation requires? But, but when you see people around you and you realize that first of all, you're getting more angry you're more fearful, or you just have a lot of anxiety, those are probably over what the situation requires. When you find yourself reacting to a small situation with a big anger, when you're fearful of going to Mexico on a mission trip, or you're fearful of, of even just handling the situation in the pandemic, and you find yourself dealing with a lot more fear than is normal, than is right, those are places where you say, okay, God, there's something broken in me. Maybe it's past hurts. Maybe it's places I have not been forgiven or I've not forgiven others. There's usually some deep roots under that. And it's, it's again, this root, fruit to root thing where I have more anger, anxiety, and fear than I should. What does that say I believe about myself? What does that say I believe about God? And then a process of repenting when we talked about a couple of weeks ago. And then there's blind spots. Those are unhealthy patterns of thinking and acting. Often they come out of our childhood. Sometimes they come out of the way that people have responded to our personality. And the, the tagline for this is, well, that's just the way I am. And sometimes we, we just excuse ourselves and sometimes we blame others. Huh, that person's just unreasonable. That person just doesn't know how to get along. The reason I have no friends is because there's no good people around here. And you fail to say, maybe the reason I have no friends is because I'm making foolish choices or I'm putting people off or, or there are things that I'm doing that are breaking up relationships. And so I would say that all of us have blind spots and it usually comes out in relationships, in our marriages, in our raising of our children, in our handling of our finances, in, in dealing with situations and crises. And you begin to see if, if you will let the shepherd lead you, he will lead you into paths of, of revelation, of truth, and of understanding yourself and how to respond differently. And, and, I, and I think there are many ones of those. Let me, let me tell you about one of mine. So I'm at a unique place in my life right now. Um, if you know my family, you know that my father just passed away. And so I'm dealing with end-of-life issues with mom and dad. And then I'm here at, 
at a ripe 65 and I'm thinking about future and past and I'm visiting with, we had a chance to go on a wonderful vacation and visit with my daughter and her husband and her grand, and her children, my grandkids, and watching them struggle in parenting and, and then watching her children as they're testing her and as they're growing up. And, and we got to have some really good conversations. Um, I hope that if you're a parent, you're able to have a good enough relationship with your kids and enough security in yourself that you can have those relationships about discussions about what did I get out of my home and what messages did I receive that weren't that healthy. And uh, when, Jay, when Ronnie was in high school, um, she was always very close to her mom and her, she and her mom were very expressive of their love for each other. And, and they would say things like, I love you more than all the green and all the grass in all the world. And I just kind of thought that stuff was silly. And, and, I, and I thought my love is to be there consistently and to help and to serve. And uh, Ronnie approached me at one point and, and she was a little afraid to even talk to me, but she said, um, I don't know if I love you, dad. And uh, I honestly didn't know what to say to that. And I, I said, yes, you do love me, and I love you, and we're family. And I kind of gave her some blanket sort of um, rationalizations or reassurances. And, uh, and we had that conversation a couple times. And what I didn't get at the time, or I didn't fully understand, is what she was really saying is, Dad, I don't know if you love me. And so we were able to have this conversation a week ago where I could talk about the fact that I grew up in a home where we were pretty suspicious of emotions. Emotions are what take you off the edge. Emotions are what lead you into doing crazy stuff and going after drugs and alcohol and illicit relationships. And, and so, boy, you ought to stick with the truth of God's word. But it was a lot of intellectual stuff more than feeling stuff. And a lot of it had to do with I'm learning this, but I don't necessarily talk about how I feel. In fact, I'm not sure how I feel often. And so my approach to emotions was to be suspicious and distrustful and, and emotions are up and down and you can't trust them. And that was kind of my orientation. And out of that, I lived kind of a shielded life. And I, and I didn't realize that the unintended consequence of that was that my very emotional daughter didn't ever really experience or feel my love as a dad. And, you know, we had a good conversation about that. And I, I explained where I came from and told her how sorry I was that I wasn't able to help her feel loved. And, you know, we are close now. And I think she does know how much I love her. But she also said the other side of it. She said, Dad, I realized it was helpful to me at one level because I had all these emotions, just this crazy mix of emotions in my in my world. And, and somehow you helped me know that I needed to put words around those and I needed to express them and I needed to be able to, to work through them and, and to act in a way that wasn't just the craziness of my emotions. And, and in some ways, that was a great preparation for her husband, who is probably less emotional than I am. And so we had this great conversation but it brought up again for me blind spots that you can't see what you can't see until somebody helps you see it. And, and sometimes it's the scripture and sometimes it's the Holy Spirit just speaking to your heart, but often it's other people. And so those blind spots are indications that we need he, for, for him to restore my soul. And then also there's numb spots. And numb spots are places where I don't feel what I should and sometimes it's a lack of empathy for people who are hurting and, and disconnected. And sometimes it's a lack of, of being motivated and empowered by the things that we should be. We talked about caring for lost people. And, and maybe at the deepest level of your heart, you're going, I, I don't really care about lost people. I don't care about people groups around the world that don't have a Bible. Uh, I don't care about my neighbors. And we don't say that out loud, but there are numb spots in our soul where the passion of what Jesus has done for us and, and even the love connections with each other. I can't feel loved. And I'll tell you, in a, in a traumatic situation, what often gets damaged is our ability to give and receive love. 
And so quite often we feel unloved, not just because no one loves us, but because we don't know how to receive that love. We, we, don't, we feel numb in that area. And then there's a, probably another side to that, and that is where I, there are a lot of feelings in there, but I don't want to feel them. So I will numb myself, self-medicating. And sometimes it's things like I, I just go on a Netflix binge and watch movies for hours and I don't want to deal with things. And sometimes it's I want to drink more or smoke more or take pills or sometimes it's just I want to stay busy. I, I get so involved that I work hard at work and I work hard at play and I don't ever have to slow down and think. I don't have to ask myself, where is my life going off? Where am I wasting my time? And some people get get involved in just living for the next adventure. They're adrenaline junkies and they're they're looking for a way to to fill up the the numb spot. And so maybe that is an indication for you that you need him to restore your soul. And then there are sore spots. And even if your life you've worked through things, you've you've realized some of your sore or your num, your numb spots, you've realized some of your hot spots, you've dealt with some of your blind spots, and then all of a sudden something comes along and it takes you out at the knees. And everybody experiences this uh, a loss of a family member or a loved one. Um, maybe you get a cancer diagnosis. Maybe all of a sudden you lose your job when you thought it was secure. Um, maybe one of your kids disowned you or your parents disown you or, or some major life trauma comes along and it just takes you out. And I don't know, I don't know that we would say it, but sometimes we feel like a sheep. Laying, oh, I, I don't know how to recover from this. I don't know what to do. And my good news for you is that we are all broken and we all need to be restored and that God is the one that can do it. We did a series back in 2018 and the series was called Everyone is Broken. And I got some pushback even from the, the title of the series. But we introduced this idea of, a, of an ancient Japanese art where they take something that's broken, in this case pottery, and they not only glue it back together, but they glue it with gold in the seams. And the beautiful part of that picture is that God can redeem our brokenness. God can pick up the pieces and he not only can make us useful again, somebody that he can pour into and we can pour into others, but it becomes beautiful. And let me tell you, when God does the work of restoring and the scars become things of beauty, it's awesome. And I don't know if that has happened in your life, but God loves to do that kind of restoring work. And then, for those of you who say, well, I, I'm not repaired with gold. I'm just broken. Let, let me tell you the other side of that is that this idea of being restored, it's possible. And it's not possible because of my strength or my ability. And quite often, I think in our heads, we say, well, maybe that works for other people, but it doesn't work for me. I, I don't know if the gospel really works for me. I don't know if God really loves me. And, and I want to just give you a, a cool Bible study uh, tip here. Psalm 23, and the way to read your Bible is often to read what's around it. And Psalm 23 is in the middle of a trilogy. And there's actually Psalm 22 and Psalm 23 and 24 that are working together to give us a beautiful and more complete picture of Jesus. And so Psalm 22 talks about the sacrifice of Jesus. And an amazing uh, supernatural thing King David, who's writing Psalms a thousand years before Jesus, when crucifixion is not even known as a way of capital punishment, he talks about his own experiences. And for him, it was metaphorical. It was his own agony that he was going through. But he uses words that then really give a better picture of what Jesus endured on the cross, even than the, the Gospels do. So let me read a couple of verses from Psalm 22. It starts with, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when Jesus gets to the point on the cross where he's about to give up his life, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because God the Father has placed all the sins of yours and mine and of the world, and he's placed it on Jesus. And then he, he goes through this discussion. He says, I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint as they would be if you were hung on a cross. My heart has turned to wax. It's melted within me. 
My tongue is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth, which is one of the aspects of crucifixion was the dehydration of the body. And then he says, all my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. And then here's the kicker. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garments. There's no way David could have known that was going to happen. So you have this picture that precedes the shepherd is that Jesus is going to lay down his life for us, that we can be not only forgiven for our sins, but our shame is removed and the power to take away the things that are causing the ill health and the the ugliness and the brokenness that Jesus takes away by the power of the cross, by the power of his sacrifice for us, by the power of the resurrection that doesn't leave him on the cross. And then you have the picture in Psalm 23 by the shepherding of Jesus, that he chose us before the creation of the world, Ephesians tells us, but then he's going to walk with us through every day of our life. And it's this very intimate picture of a shepherd living with his sheep and guiding them with a staff and a rod and and choosing their pasture and even leading them through the valley of the shadow of death. And our lives can be restored because of the shepherd's tender, intimate care for us. And then the next chapter is a completely different picture in Psalm 24. It talks about the king of glory. Let me read you a couple of verses from 24. It says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters, which is why I chose the word by the sovereignty of Jesus. That Jesus isn't just a broken man on a cross. He's not even just a nice shepherd guy that's walking us through life. He is eventually... Not only did he come, first of all, in the triumphal entry, riding on a donkey when the people were praising and yelling, but that's a little bit of a a glimpse of what's going to be like in Revelation. It talks about him riding in on a white horse and being the king of glory. And it says, lift up your heads, you gates, be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. And there's this picture of the power of the resurrected Jesus. And so you put those together, that the sacrifice of Jesus, the the gentle hand of Jesus shepherding us through our life, and the the clear end that there's going to be a, a final alpha and omega, that he is going to sum everything up and he is going to put everything right. And that our hope and our future is on, ultimately, we will be fully restored not going to ever be fully restored here on this earth, but someday everything will be put right. And I hope you're looking forward to that day. I hope your your hope is placed in Jesus, not only as the shepherd of today, but he's the king of glory. And then the last point that I want you to get to your heart is that restoration is a process. You can't take one class and have it all be done. You can't learn a few things. You can't even go through a few eye-opening experiences or breakthroughs. It is a process. And that's why I love that Psalm 23 picture that he takes us sometimes from the hill, sometimes in the valley, sometimes by the water, sometimes in the desert, that he's always walking with us and leading us. And the cool part about it is that God is in charge of the process. And he, he takes me through this. It says, he restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. That's really, really important that we have a tendency, especially when we're talking about brokenness and needing healing, and and we come to Jesus and say, oh, I hurt so bad. I want you to fix me. I I keep making a mess of my relationships. I want you to straighten me out. And what we really want is a better life for me. I want my feelings to be better. I want my marriage better. I want my kids better. I want my finances better. And it's easy for us to even take this picture of Jesus being our shepherd and turn it all into, it's all about me. But I don't want you to see what he's saying here. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness. Well, paths of righteousness are his paths. It's the right words at the right time with the right, the right motives that God is leading me to have his righteousness. Now at the cross, and when I come and ask 
him to take over my life for the first time. He gives me his righteousness as a gift. But then there's the rest of my life he spends helping me learn to live in that righteousness and walk in that and think like that and believe. And this fruit to root thing is where I look at the fruit of my life and it evidences where I'm not believing the right thing about myself and I'm not believing the right thing about God. And so God wants to restore a true belief about him and a true picture of myself as a follower of his paths, because you see, ultimately, he's leading me for his purposes. And the beautiful part about it is that it says he leads us. So the the picture of one shepherd and one lone sheep, yeah, sometimes he comes after us. And that's the, the beautiful picture of the Jesus gives of the shepherd who leaves 99 who are all safely in the corral. And he goes out and he looks for the one that's probably got its feet in the air and dying. And he looks for that one, but the majority picture is that he's leading a flock. And I think this is really key because we need each other as sheep. If you're going to be a part of a growing, restored spiritual life, it's going to be because you're in community together with other believers. And I don't mean that you just have coffee and donuts together. I mean where you share your lives and you pray for each other and you're able to be authentic and vulnerable. And I know that this pandemic has been a difficult season for that. And I'm so grateful for our online ministries and for Austin who is helping set up the online Zoom groups and helping people stay connected. But I also know from talking to people that that there are some people that through this have gotten disconnected. And I'll tell you, when a wolf is gonna go after her sheep, it's the one that's away from the flock. And and often when we get kind of just drifting away, we get out of, out of habit of going to life groups, out of habit of just coming to church services together and, and not only hearing the word, but, but interacting with each other and praying for each other and caring for each other. And honestly, it doesn't matter to me whether it's in the building or out of the building, but we desperately need to be in community together because it's, he leads us together. And I tell you, my life has been so helped in the restoration by other sheep that I'm following and watching and learning from. Sometimes they're examples of what not to do and often they're examples of what to do. So he leads us in paths of righteousness because it's about him. And then I want to also mention that at Family Church, we try to help this restoration process be as effective as possible. And clearly just coming to a weekend service or listening online, it, it puts you in a spectator role. And we try to have ways to not only encourage you to be in community, but to be in community with people who will maybe deal with the same things that you're dealing with. So life groups is for everybody, where you get together and you study the scriptures and you you pray for each other and you care for each other. And I really hope that you're already in a group. And if you're not, I'd love to see you get there. But there's also specialized care, divorce care for people who have gone through the heartbreak of a divorce those people who have gone through um, conquers is for people who are dealing with sexual addiction and pornography issues and, and talking honestly with each other and holding each other accountable and helping see what are, the, what are the roots underneath that. Why do I keep falling into that? And for the spouses, uh, wives of those of guys who are dealing with sexual uh, addictions, there's betrayal and beyond, the special class. And then there's grief class for any kind of grief, but specifically for those who've lost a loved one. Love and logic to help you examine your parenting patterns and what you got from your home that was junk and what you got from your home that was a jewel. And then financial peace, the, the stories and the, the beliefs that you got about money and what, how to use money and how to control money instead of it controlling you. And then we have a restoration class, which is probably our our most intensive effort. And we haven't done one for a while, but there's one coming in January. And it's a a class where, again, not where you have to talk so much. This one is more about really learning and listening to things that will help you identify the hurt spots, especially in your life and the the habits and the hangups that you have dealt with. And because of that, it's a, it's been powerful in many people's lives. And, and then we also have a care team. And that leads me to the, the next part of this, because the beauty of it is that a lot of people on the care team, they write cards, they make phone calls and have visits 
to some of the prayer requests that you turn in or that people who are hurting. And you know what often is true about them? They've often been hurt and healed. And so that's the beautiful part is that restoration is a process that's for his name's sake. You see, we often think it's for my benefit, and, and it is. It's a wonderful benefit that, that God restores and renews me, but that's not the end of it. The point is that it's supposed to be to bring him glory, that when my life is broken and a mess and God welds the gold in the joints to put me back together, then it is for his name's sake. And the cool part about it is that I am then able to be on mission with the shepherd. You see, he doesn't heal us just so we can feel better. He heals us so that we can join him in his process of finding lost sheep that are stuck upside down. Some of them that are not even followers of Jesus and some that are. And we can allow God to redeem the broken places in us so that my hurts, as Jesus heals them, they become a way for me to have a conversation with somebody who's in a similar problem. I know that that I've been deeply helped in my helping people through grief by the fact that I lost my brother and I experienced that. I get it. And the beautiful thing is that the, the valleys that God takes us through and the restoration he brings in our life, he can then redeem and use to help and encourage other people. And that's how it comes full circle. So I, I'm going to hand off to the campus pastors and, and let me just... Uh, let you take a few moments to think about these things and to make an assessment of, as we probe around in your soul, what's God trying to say to you today about the fact that he wants to restore your soul. Thanks for joining us. Love you guys.